Hello, welcome to Convocation today. Uh, I'm very glad to have our presenter here today and the, her guests as well. Uh, my name is David Allred and I'm uh, the coordinator for Convocations. I'd like to just make a couple of quick announcements specifically for those of you who are in the class and uh, then introduce our speaker today. Um, I do want to welcome everyone who's watching online as well. We look around this room, and uh, I think I mentioned this last week, it's a small number in here, but for every one person in here, there's five people watching online. And so uh, I want to welcome all of you watching online as well. Um, there is a live chat that goes along with this, and I'm really thrilled that it's there so you can ask questions or let us know if the audio isn't working. But please remember that that's an extension of the classroom and uh, to keep your comments professional and on topic. Um, immediately after this presentation, you do have an assignment. It's the InnoA response. And so it will open at 1.20. And uh, it's due by 3 o'clock. But it, it, it will be open after that if you need to uh, turn it in a little bit later because you have a class or a lab or something like that. And then just you have some ongoing assignments for the whole semester. Remember, I want to meet everyone once at least during the semester. I met some of you before class. Uh, I'm available after if you want to come up and uh, we can do a COVID handshake of just like waving at each other uh, if um, you haven't met me already. And also the cultural events are open. There's some this week, uh, the planetarium. There's several art shows. Uh, the U Utah Humanities Book Festival is all virtual this year, and we've posted some of those options as well. Remember, you need to attend three cultural events by the end of the semester. And uh, if you are in Convocation Plus, which is only a small group of the, the students, there's 26 of you in that extra class, we are having a discussion tonight. It's optional, but uh, it's the first one. Uh, you can come at 5 o'clock and check your email for all the details. Uh, Finally, I just want to mention, uh, we're going to have time for some question and answers as part of the presentation. Uh, but if you, and so we'll, we'll do some Q&A there, but I'd ask you to not come up and ask questions afterwards of our speaker. If you have questions, you can pass them through me and I'll send them on. So let me introduce our speaker. Um, Melissa Weising, Wais, in a way, grew up going to school in Orange County, California, but she spent spring breaks and summer vacations with her cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandparents in Gunnison, Utah. She received her undergraduate and PhD degrees from Harvard University, and she's currently a senior lecturer in Asian studies at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. She's also a historian at the Church, of, at the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the title of her presentation, I think, is one of the greatest titles I've seen with any convocation that we've had. The title is, In Japan, Eating a Popsicle on the Street is Worse Than Being Naked in Front of Strangers, Human Beings and the Challenge of Culture. So will you join me in welcoming Melissa Inouye to the stand? Thank you so much for that kind welcome and for this wonderful hospitality you've shown me and my family. So I'm so happy to be here at Snow College because I had this really early memory of Snow College. I don't even remember how old I was, but I, we would always come out here to Gunnison, where my aunt and uncle lived. And I remember, um, I don't, we, for some reason, we couldn't go to the Gunnison pool, so we came to the pool here at Snow College. And I remember being wet and cold in the Snow College pool locker room. It's like this very vivid memory. Um, so I'm so happy to finally be here experiencing the real Snow College. And of course, everything always looks different when you're an adult as opposed to when you're a kid. I don't know if I'd recognize the locker room now anyway. So I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm, as um, David has mentioned, I'm here in, my, in kind of dual capacities as a professor of Asian studies at the University of Auckland and then also as a historian for the Church History Department. And what I do at the Church History Department, oh, I wanted to show you my... Uh, Maybe this is how old I was when I was in the locker room at Snow College. Can you guys see the PowerPoint, or is it supposed to be on the screen? OK, you can get it on the screen. There's nothing to see anyway. It's just me, so there we go. Um, but the church history department, what I'm working on are the global histories. So it's histories of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in different parts of the world. 
we've discovered, of course, um, when people in my faith tradition thought of church history, they tended to think of American history. Um, but global churches don't have America-only histories. And at the church history department, we're trying really hard to change the America-centric culture of church history and create a new culture of church history that reflects who the Latter-day Saints really are. So today I'd like to talk about culture. And um, some people in the front row, I'm going to put you on the spot. Sorry, you sat there. So um, what do you think, if, if I said, give me a definition of culture, what would you say? Something from maybe music and arts of a, of a different, uh, of a specific group, a nation, or people uh, to the languages or social interactions that they have with one another as well. Great, music, art, language, social interactions. Uh, what about you? I think also the traditions that go along with those um, different, you know, family ties, um, what's popular in that country, that kind of thing. What's popular, like, um, can you be specific, like what's an example? Oh, sorry. <laughs> like music or um, literature or art. Those music, literature, great. Thank you very much. Okay, also in the front row, I'm asking you guys, what is culture good for? Um, I think culture brings individualism to a group of people, helps them feel tied to other people that they might not even know. Okay. Another one. What's culture good for? One more. I think it helps us realize a lot more about what life is meant to be. Just having that culture within us that we could see other people's culture as well and just see the differences of living aspects. Okay, so identity and a kind of sense of all humanity. Okay, last question. What's culture bad for? What's the, pro what's the problem with culture? Uh, picking on you two in the front row, one or you, or both of you, answer the question. What's it bad for? What's culture bad for? When is culture a problem? When is culture a problem? Ooh. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Dang, I don't know. <laughs> um, I see a hand right there. Uh, it could give a us versus them mentality, sort of like um, China against the U.S., I guess. So okay, so when you lump people into big groups, then you have this problem of we, we have to be in these lumps. We can't yeah. be ourselves. Great. Um, did anyone else in the front row want to say anything about when culture is a problem? Uh, okay. One more. It creates stigma. It creates stigma. Okay, interesting. So again, it sounds like another kind of, um, like they, they make markers for each other, and those, those cultural markers can be attached to negative or positive things. Okay, thank you very much. This is very good. So you've had um, cultures, arts, language, music, traditions, family ties, popular music, groups of people, identity, group identity, and a kind of sense of how we sit in the world. This is really good. Um, I'd like to kind of elaborate on this a little bit. I want to make a couple of points. Number one, um, culture is usually based on climate and geography. It's not just about people, but it's usually always human made, right? Culture is a human creation. It's something that we build and we sustain over generations. It's good for communicating things. In America, everyone drives on the right side of the road. Everyone just knows that's the side of the road you drive on. In New Zealand, everyone drives on the left side of the road. Um, Wherever you are in America and New Zealand, it's good that everyone's driving on one side of the road. The kind of other side of that is that culture is also requires conformity. If you were in America and you didn't always drive on the right-hand side of the road, that would be a big problem. It could kill people. Um, another problem is, for example, uh, in, like in, for example, in the East Asian nations, there's a huge emphasis on testing and academic learning to the point where there's cram schools after school that students attend to kind of get ahead, to catch up. But if you're not the kind of person who has that kind of a learning style where you really benefit you know, from a kind of testing-based system, you suffer in that kind of an educational system because that's how the system's set up. It's not set up for you. Um, another way in which cults can be difficult is in um, excess of judgment. So when I was living in China with a one-year-old, um, everyone was always interviewing us on what we fed the kid. And if we told him we fed you know, him 
rice or these other things, they're like, no. That is not what you feed a kid this age. You feed the kid steamed eggs with chopped up rice and little tiny bits of meat. Every single person in the city of Hefei, China, who encountered us, who interviewed us about what we fed our kids, said no. Steamed eggs, chopped up shrimp, meat. How could you not feed him this? You are terrible parents. And so this kind of state of constant tension that we found ourselves in um, was a reminder to us of kind of the power of culture. Everyone had these very strong opinions about what would make someone a good parent. There's like a moral judgment attached to this. And that leads me to the title of this talk. So this, as showing the global histories. So this summer, my kids were in Japan for a family reunion. I wasn't there, but they gave me a big report. And um, they ate a lot of tasty things. It was very hot. And so in the heat, they also ate popsicles. And one of the places you get popsicles is this wonderful convenience store called Family Mart. It's like a 7-Eleven. Let's see. Oh, no, I can't make it play. It's Family Mart sound. Sad. OK. Well, if you Google Family Mart sound on YouTube, you'll hear there's a very distinctive sound, a song, a jingle that it plays every time these beautiful doors open to an air-conditioned store where inside there are these large treasure chests full of popsicles like this, the gadi gadi. It's an onomatopoetic for the sound you make when you're chewing a popsicle. This is mochi ice cream. So it's ice cream, and there's a chewy rice coating on the outside. This is a red bean popsicle. It's uh, kind of sweet and creamy, made out of azuki beans. And this is the best of all. You can get this at uh, Asian stores in Utah, because I've got them. So this is a waffle on the outside, very crispy. And then there's soft vanilla ice cream. And in the very middle, there's a thin line of chocolate, uh, like crispy chocolate. And you, you bite into it, and your teeth go through the three layers, and it's like the best. So anyway. So Isaiah learned um, when he was walking along the street, it was actually rude to have a popsicle or have anything, like an apple, a sandwich, as you walked along the street. Because if you're eating as you walk along the street, you might drop some of your popsicle or your sandwich or whatever. It would fall on the ground. Someone's going to step on it, and it's going to track goopy stuff all over the street. And you know that kind of yucky feeling that you get when you approach a a trash can outside of a 7-Eleven, you know, that, that's the kind of feeling that the Japanese people are trying to avoid. So you, you don't eat on the street in Japan. However, my kids also discovered uh, the joys of the onsen, which is the Japanese bath. It's a public bath, and the way you take the public bath is completely naked. So you, before going into the public bath, you put your clothes in the locker, you scrub yourself very clean on these stools next to other people who are also completely naked, scrubbing themselves very clean. And then once you've done that and you're nice and clean, then you jump into this beautiful, super hot, uh, hot spring water from natural hot springs, uh, probably with, um, potentially with a bunch of other people. And my children were uh, at an onsen that had a kind of kids area, and there was a pool. And uh, this, this pool was not quite as hot as the adult pools, and there was also a water slide. So they were jumping out of the water, running over to the water slide, zooming down the water slide. Uh, doing it over and over again, shrieking with laughter, enjoying being completely naked in front of strangers. And when we came back home, my son said with kind of wide eyes, um, in Japan, it's not OK to eat a popsicle as you're walking down the street, but it's OK to be naked in front of strangers. <laughs> so this is a playful example, but it illustrates the realities of culture. If you were to be naked in the Snow College pool, that would be bad. You might be disciplined by the college. You might be civilly. Something might happen to you in terms of the, the legal enforcement. Um, in this particular local context in Ephraim, if you walked to a swimming pool naked, you, you would likely be viewed as morally suspect in some way. In Kyoto, Japan, a person who walked along the street licking a popsicle would similarly attract judgment. Inconsiderate, uncouth, rude. So more is at stake than clothes or no clothes, popsicle or no popsicle. What's at stake is a definition of propriety or wrongdoing, and essentially the definition of right and wrong. So here's another example of how this works from my field of Christianity in China. So uh, in the history of Christianity in China, Chinese artists uh, began to produce their own devotional images when, if, if they were converted to Christianity. And so here you have a story from the Bible of the wealthy young man in the Gospel of Mark. He says to Jesus, what can I do to gain eternal life? Jesus says, sell all your stuff to the poor. And the old man is sad, and he goes away sorrowing because he was very rich, and he didn't want to do that. 
So here's a roughly contemporaneous picture of um, an, the same story depicted by a German artist around the same time. And in terms of how people expect Jesus to look, I would guess that in today's audience, people would probably mostly feel like the German Jesus looks like the right Jesus, or the correct Jesus, or at least a normal Jesus, versus the person on the right who might look like this kind of strangely Chinese Jesus. But to the Chinese Christians, the Jesus with the black hair and the wispy beard was a Jesus who felt like Jesus, and they could see themselves in his followers, compared to the weird foreign barbarian Jesus who looked like a foreign barbarian. So culture is not simply the clothing that the Chinese Christian artist has painted on the person or the choices the artist has made about depicting facial hair. Culture in these pictures, depending on the viewer, makes the difference between that ethnic-looking guy and Christ, the savior of all. Culture is a force that creates these subtle signals of right and wrong, belonging and foreignness, moral rectitude and unacceptability. Too often we think about culture as folk dances and special foods. This is an erroneous touristy view of culture. It sees cu culture as a sort of decoration in life, a trapping, apparel that change a generic human being into a Latvian or a Thai or an American. But as we have always also seen just now, culture goes much deeper than traditional foods or dress. It's moral values, it's priorities. Culture is assumptions about human nature, about other people, and about how we experience reality and even the divine. The challenge of culture that I'd like to s explore today is this. We know that people around the world are innately different. We have different genes, we're born in different situations, with different mother tongues. But what about after the difference? What happens when we grow up and start making choices about how and where to live in the world? What should we do about the distance that culture creates between us as human beings? what journeys and what work are required of us because of that distance. Today I'm going to tell four stories that kind of um, talk about people who have made these crossings or cross these cultural distances. And uh, the point of these, of these stories is to emphasize the fact that we all know people are unique and distinct, but we have to do something about the chasms between us not just between us and strangers in another country, between ourselves and the people we love who see the world so differently. So first, let's give an example from the field of Chinese Christian history, which I study. Man, these are big distances. So in the late 16th century, when the first Western missionary to China, Matteo Ricci, wrote a letter to his family in Italy, it took seven years for the letter to arrive and for him to receive a reply. Seven years. And the early European missionaries, because of these distances, who went to China, ended up living out their entire lives there. They worked and worked at how to present themselves in Chinese society. And the thing about cultural distance is that when you travel outside your culture, you risk losing all of your capital, the, the things that you have worked so hard to accumulate. So for example, the Jesuit missionaries were some of the most educated people in Europe at this time, in the 17th and the 18th century. They studied the Jesuit college in Rome, learning mathematics, astronomy, canon making, several languages. Then they went to China. And here in this new place, they discovered the Chinese regarded them as foreign barbarians, people with weirdly high noses who had bad manners. They wrote like kindergartners and they talked like drunks. When they got to China, they tried to figure out an equivalent for who they are and they decided that they were kind of the most like Buddhist monks. So they went into the cities and they shaved their heads like the Buddhist monks they wore colored robes like the Buddhist monks because they said, you know, we are celibate, we um, are religious, we have this creed, we have scriptures, we must match up with the Buddhist monks. So if we go and look like Buddhist monks, then people will understand who we are and what we're about. But actually they had been in China for some years and they eventually learned more language and they learned more about the culture and they realized that Buddhist monks in China in this time uh, were very, uh, held in very low regard. Uh, partly because, because uh, one of the ways that the, it, in China at this time to kind of get fed or, or make a living as begging if you had no money and no food was to be a Buddhist monk. 
this was a kind of default career for people who had no food and no money. Because if you could beg as a Buddhist monk, at least you had a good excuse to be begging, because Buddhist monks were supposed to not be attached. And they weren't, they're supposed to kind of beg for their food, uh, and, and so on. But they found, the Jesuit missionaries found that the Buddhist monks were held in very low regard, and actually were seen as quite immoral by people in society. And so they had unwittingly, by trying to transpose themselves onto this other religious figure uh, in a different culture, they had unwittingly sabotaged their cause through their co lack of cultural knowledge. So they worked hard to correct this. And the, they grew their hair long. They started to wear the fancy robes of scholars, of literati, who were not religious at all. Um, but they got so good at writing elegant calligraphy and drafting scholarly prose and translating books into Chinese, they were eventually invited to live at the emperor's court in Beijing as kind of resident scientists. So for example, here is uh, Johann Adam Schall von Bell. He's, uh, this is a depiction of him. He's wearing his court robes, and um, he's got a crane on his, the square on the front, which shows his insignia. It shows his rank. He's the highest level of civil official in the entire imperial bureaucracy. And he's shown with his astronomical instruments. So the emperor valued the Jesuits for their skill as scientists and kept them at the court. Here's um, a picture drawn by Giuseppe Castiglione, who was a Jesuit painter who worked for the Qianlong Emperor right here. And you can see in these paintings that he did, in, uh, he was very prolific, and he's actually one of the most famous painting, painters in China in all of Chinese history. Like, Chinese people know his name and consider him one of the greatest painters in China. And he was this European missionary. But if you look at this chair, you can see there's a, a perspective. It's wide at the front, and then it gets narrow at the back. That shows the influence of Castiglione's Western painting techniques with Chinese media and subjects. Here's another that shows his use of shading. So the Jesuits were really interesting. They were extremely successful in some ways because they were at the very top of China's governmental and cultural hierarchy from a certain point of view. Um, their approach to missionary work emphasized being scholarly, not being kind of monks. It emphasized working from the top down through relationships with people instead of evangelizing just people on the street. It emphasized the use of science because the literati at that time were interested in practical learning. And it exercised great tolerance for Confucian funeral rites. So um, historian Nicholas Standard says of Ricci, he emphasizes the role of the Chinese and of his, his encounter with the Chinese in making him who he was. The role of the other in the formation of Ricci's identity is certainly as important as the activity of Ricci's self. Though he might have reacted in ways other than he did, in all cases, the other played a decisive role in the reactions he showed. One could even argue that the other made it possible for Ricci to become who he became. Without the other, this would not have been possible. Cultural distances demand sacrifice. And we can see this in the history of um, New Zealand converts among the Maori. So I study the history of missionaries, not only in China, but also in places where the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints exists. And this church existed in New Zealand from the early 1850s, but around that time, they only evangelized the Pakaha, the white population. And it wasn't until the 1880s that they shifted their strategy to work with the Maori and found a receptive audience. There was a push factor of other Christian groups linked to colonization and also the disruptions of war and disease. And then there was a pull factor of a tradition that Maori had of seers and prophets who had given prophecies that certain kinds of missionaries would come and who the Maori recognized as the Latter-day Saint missionaries. There were also charismatic practices, reverence for ancestors, and significantly, the marginalized status of both the Latter-day Saint missionaries and the Maori. The Latter-day Saint missionaries were poor and scorned by other Christian groups, so they usually lived with the local Maori branch president sleeping on the floor and eating, eating the local food. Uh, one Maori leader who became a Latter-day Saint talked about the ways in which the uh, missionaries were humble, uh, came into their places and ate what they ate and learned their language. So one of the early converts was Chief Hirini Terito Fanga of the Nati Kahungunu Iwi, and he and his wife, Mere Mete, lived in the Hawke's Bay region of the North Island of New Zealand. They had heard a Matakite, a seer's prophecy, made in Hirini's grandfather's lifetime. And when the missionaries preached to Maori in the area in 1884, one of them raised his hands to bless his hearers, which Hirini and Mere saw as a fulfillment of prophecy. They decided to join the church, and this was the first of a series of incredible um, journeys that they would make. They decided to emigrate to Utah, 
like other European converts who were following this then encouraged practice of gathering to Zion. Kidney was the head of his iwi. So uh, in English, I guess it's kind of like a local tribe. It's not just local, it's like a kind of a regional power. And his people resisted his departure, but he was very insistent that he wanted to do temple work um, in the Latter-day Saint temples in Salt Lake City. So in June 1894, Hirene, Mere, and six family de members departed, leaving behind their families and their lives of prestige. Now unfortunately, because of racial sentiments at the time, although European New Zealand converts had been welcomed in Zion, native Maori immigrants were discouraged from gathering by church leaders. Uh, by the mission president and also by leaders in Salt Lake City. So the church leaders sent Hidani and Mede and their family away from Salt Lake to Kanab, and uh, accompanied by two returned Latter-day Saint missionaries who mismanaged their money and reduced them to desperate financial straits. Eventually, a Salt Lake City group of missionaries who called themselves Zion's Maori Association intervened, bringing Hidani and Mede back to Salt Lake City. On October 9th, 1895, Hidani and Mede were endowed and sealed in the Salt Lake Temple, receiving the ordinances they had crossed the sea to receive. And thereafter, they spent much of their time performing temple ordinances. Hidani served a mission in New Zealand and, um, met and returned to Salt Lake, where he died in 1905. Mede later, Mede later returned to New Zealand to serve a mission and returned to Salt Lake City. So about a decade later, in the midst of the 1918 flu pandemic, Mede returned to New Zealand again uh, she and her, uh, this is kind of interesting, the times we're in, she and the family members in her party were quarantined in Auckland Harbor for about a week because someone on board had flu symptoms, and this was in 1918 in the middle of the last great pandemic. Uh, they were grateful to finally step back onto their native soil and reunite with their family members in Iwi, but eventually uh, Mere went back to Salt Lake City, and she's buried next to Hidani. He died in 1944. Peter Lynham is a scholar who studies the history of the Māori and the Latter-day Saints in New Zealand, and he observed that there were points of alignment culturally, the ancestry um, issues, the kind of concern with ancestors, priestly rights, tradition of prophets, the marginality of these two peoples, but also points of distance. Um, the language and culture were hard for the Mormon missionaries to master because they were always changing and they didn't spend a lot of time, comparatively speaking, you know, compared to the Chinese Jesuits learning these languages and cultures. There were also these ideas of racial hierarchy and white supremacy that we saw Hidani and Mede had to encounter, and strict ecclesiastical conformity that enforced uh, rules from America as well as strict hierarchical rules. So uh, Peter Lynham notes this cultural divide in 1990, which was a year in which New Zealand was seeking to affirm these two cultural traditions, the European tradition and the local native tradition. And Peter Lynham says something really interesting. He says, unfortunately, this aspiration minimizes the degree to which culture is problematic, for no two cultures can ever match each other exactly. And no religious message can simply be stripped of one set of cultural associations and reclothed with others. So once again, in the distances that Hidani and Mere had to travel, in the distances that the missionaries in New Zealand had to travel, to learn languages, to learn cultures, to live with the local people. We see the work that goes into these long journeys, these long traverses. So another story from the global histories that I'm working on now and that have been produced by my colleagues shows how people planned across these distances to bridge these cultural divides quite intentionally and how they've got to, they, they stuck to their plan even though it was annoying and painful and exasperating work. In 1981 in South Africa, there was a small group of black Latter-day Saints living in Soweto, which is a township outside of Johannesburg. And this is right in the middle of apartheid. So Johannesburg was a you know, completely white space, and Soweto was a completely black space, a township on, on the edge of Johannesburg. So this small group of black Latter-day Saints, um, including the Malangus and including members like France Lequati from Soweto had to rise at 4.30 a.m. to travel to church in Johannesburg and to arrive on time by 9 a.m. They'd take an early train and they'd have this long, long walk. In 1981, the local, their local leader, the stake president, Olaf Time, consulted with them and they decided they would love to have their own local congregation in Soweto. It wasn't, there weren't enough of them. And so the stake president, Time, interviewed 200 white members in Johannesburg and chose 40 of them and called them to attend this new ward in Soweto. 
to make kind of a critical mass. Now, there were misgivings on both sides. Of course, um, at that time, during this age of ap apartheid, whites had tremendous privilege and power. Without a doubt, the people who were the least safe and the most inconvenienced were the black members of the branch. But the whites also, in participating in the Soweto branch, were leaving their place of privilege and safety and making that same journey that the black members had made, but in the other direction. Maureen Zill was, Van Zill was the primary president of, in charge of the youth in the congregation at the time. She said, we did not know what we were going to face and how we would be accepted. Whites never went into Soweto, never, ever. Kumbulani Mdelete, who was a member, a black member of the Soweto branch, recalled, having been raised in the apartheid system as a young person, I knew there was a difference between white people and black people. White people were my enemies. And so, in 1981, we had this experiment where these two groups of people uh, came together and tried to be a congregation together. There were some uh, rough spots. Uh, Maureen Van Zyl, the primary president, recalled that at a certain point in a Relief Society meeting, they sang for their opening song, the South African National Anthem, not realizing that for the black members of the congregation, that was a strongly apartheid symbol, and it, a white supremacist symbol, and they felt really bad. Uh, Maureen said that she was mortified when, um, when they found that they had offended them, and they worked back and forth to figure out how to fix each, how to, um, how to learn to be together. She said, we shared all sorts of things, how they did certain things and how we did certain things, and so it was just this time of learning together. The greatest change was that I saw blacks as not strangers any longer, but as fellow South Africans and fellow friends. Um, Kumbulani Mdelechse talks about how these experiences together, these lived experiences, these interactions with the other people and jostling back and forth, uh, figuring things out, was what helped them to learn to see, to see each other in a different way. So the Soweto members paid a price for the distances that they traveled. It took time, it took effort, but in the end, they had an integrated church congregation 13 years before the end of apartheid in South Africa. They were pioneers in just starting to bridge the racial and cultural divide. And of course we know these, these divides are, are vast and they have not been bridged, um, I think, anywhere in the world at this point. But they, they did something. They crossed a distance. The last story I'd like to share is a story of my own family. So my paternal ancestors were Japanese. I was born in Southern California. My father was born just over here in Richfield. My grandfather was born in Northern California. My grandmother was born in Eastern Washington. My great-grandparents came from Fukuoka, Japan. Here's my great-grandfather, Sashichi Inoue. Here's Sashichi and my great-grandmother, Mikano, with three, their three daughters. Um, this is Ruth, my aunt, or my great-aunt, growing up in California, going to a local school. She was born in America. My grandfather went to Stanford, you know, also born in America. And here's the family just before the war. They had a farm. They had um, a gross business, like a produce business. And then the war came, which we all know in times of stress, uh, racism flares up, uh, cultural differences become more pronounced, these gaps widen to the point where the Japanese were, Japanese Americans were stripped of their civil rights, their constitutional rights, and sent to prison camps. This one was in Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, one thing that came out of that camp was that my two grandparents, who were teachers in the Buddhist Sunday school, at Heart Mountain met, and they married in the camp. After the camp, they came to Sigurd, Utah, and began farming. And our family has many um, memories and kind of uh, traditions in this area. They farmed potatoes, and they were friends. And at a certain point, we started making journeys back the other way towards our homeland. So my aunt Anne and all of my uncles went on missions to Japan, and here she is at her mission. We also traveled back to Japan uh, in 2019 for this family reunion. So the Inouye family story tells us, well, tells us members of the Inouye family that we've done some hard things and we've experienced some big changes. From Japan to California, Heart Mountain to Utah, from Buddhism to our current faith in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 
from farms to cities. Since we've crossed these distances, we know we have the ability to keep making difficult journeys. And this is true for everyone. So in sum, like the, in sum, I'm not as interested in celebrating diversity as I am in crossing distance. I know that in some ways these are basically the same thing, but my point is that diversity is not a party. It's exhausting. It requires a lot of work. Human experience is characterized by stark differences and disjunctures. The space between us is vast, even when we're not socially distancing. Yet cross it we must if we are to be useful to anyone outside a tiny, familiar circle of look and think alikes. Furthermore, like Matteo Ricci, when you go out, get your education and go out into the world, you'll find that some things change you forever. And once you leave your paradigm, you can never go back. This uncertainty is scary. The lack of control can be scary. It can be paralyzing. Sometimes we will be pushed into these cultural chasms involuntarily. But like the Jesuits in China, like Kirini and Mere Fanga, like the members of the Soweto branch, and Fasichi and Mikano Inoue and their children, we must not shrink from long crossings, be they physical, cultural, ideological, or otherwise. If you haven't felt the pull and drag of cultural difference in your life, and if you don't know the exhaustion of trying to traverse daunting cultural divides that separate you from other people, then I would humbly submit that the world you're living in is probably too small. The effort and the tension and the discomfort of cultural work is how it feels to be a human in the midst of humanity, not sequestered in a tiny spot of ground, but connected to the lives and of others whose experiences are as vital and as valid as our own. Just as we have this feeling of being tired after a day of manual labor, and this feeling also tells us that we're strong and resilient, Paying the price to cross cultural distance tells us we're living our lives up to the full measure of our humanity. So, in sum, I'd just like to leave you with a charge. Oh, and I would also like to say, if you absolutely know how exhausting the, distant, the, the work of kind of crossing between ideological or cultural differences is, then, um, then kudos to you. And it's okay sometimes to take a break and to give yourself a break because it's work, and you need to rest. So in sum, I'd like to encourage you not only to see difference and to recognize difference, but to cross the distances that are created by those differences. Culture is part of who we are, and it's part of who everyone is. It's so important, and in some ways, we will never solve the problem of culture or the challenge of culture. It's, we are too different. But what is real and what we can do something about is this, what we do about this distance. What do you do about the distance, the cultural distance between you and others? This can be um, how people feel about um, race. It can be how people act. It can be how people um, understand what's divine or true or good. And because so much is at stake in culture, that's why it's so hard to bridge those distances. But that's what it means to be human in the midst of humanity. And I commend that work to all of you. Thank you. We have, we have time questions. for a few questions. So how long have you been working for the church history department? I probably about a year. Yeah. I'm very new. I'm like the newest employee in the whole department. It was great tenure there and great retention. How would you say that studying culture and seeing all these different cultures has changed your perspective on what's the most important things in life for you? I think it's kind of freeing. So when you go to a place and you find that everyone is just appalled that you're not feeding your kids steamed eggs with chopped up shrimp and little bits of meat. 
then you realize that there's probably a lot of things that you're appalled about that maybe don't matter as much as you thought they did. And then when you do that in a bunch of places, like if you live in three different places and you find that there's a lot of things that are really different that everyone in that particular place is completely committed to, it's, it's kind of freeing because you realize that maybe the thing that you think is best for your family is the thing that's best for your family. So I think that's what it's been for me. But I'm afraid, um, I, I'm afraid by this silence that I haven't been controversial enough. So my, I'm going to elaborate a little bit. So my point is that culture is not just about you know, the ways that people feed their kids breakfast or about the ways that people, um, yeah, about places where we travel and learn. It's about everything. It's about political views, how people feel about wearing masks. It's everything. So my, my point is that culture cannot be problematic enough. It's really problematic. Can I ask a follow-up question from yeah. that? Because I was uh, going to ask a controversial question. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the middle of an election in this country, and we feel so polarized in this country. Uh, your presentation talks a lot about global, crossing global boundaries. But what can you say about crossing cultural boundaries within our communities, within our school within the state. Right. Well, you know, the, both the Soweto example and the example of my parents were kind of domestic examples, right? Because they talked about how people in one place decided they were going to do something <laughs> in a positive way and a negative way, right? So the Soweto branch, they said, we're going to, we're going to try this, we're going to do this, and we're going to try to bring um, people of these different cultures and these different racial backgrounds and identities together. Um, in the case of my family, in I guess there's good and bad things in their stories. So in the case of my family, in the very beginning of the war, they said, you know, no, you're no Japanese, you are not okay. Um, even if you're born here, your culture makes you like the enemy and is as good as the enemy, you're not okay. And they sent them to these camps. Um, but then on the other side of the camps, uh, my family had uh, wonderful experiences and has made wonderful friends. My uncle and my, my uncles, my dad, my aunt, you know, grew up in Gunnison and, and Sigurd and Richfield with these wonderful lifelong friends. And that's an example, I think, of ways in which people did the work to overcome those boundaries. But you always have to do the work. That's my point. It's like a big problem and it takes a lot of work. And if you're not, if you don't feel like you're working with a cultural problem right now, then I think you're, you need to expand your education because that's what it means to be a human. Is it hard to try and go out and experience other cultures without feeling the last bit again? Can you say that last bit again? Is it hard to experience um, other cultures? Is it hard to go out and experience and learn about other cultures? Um, without feeling absolutely clueless and inexperienced? Uh, no, I, wait, is it hard? Can, can you do it without feeling clueless and inexperienced? No, I don't think so. I think it's part of the, of the learning. And if you don't feel clueless and inexperienced, then you probably haven't gone far enough, away enough from home. And I don't just mean like physically, right? Like in a conversation with a student on this campus, you could go really far from home, right? And, and to feel clueless and experienced is to know that you're going into the right, into the right space. You're, you're going to learn something and you're going to have awareness about what's normal for you and what's different for you. I have just one other question. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what this bridging culture, like you talk about bridging cultures and it takes work. What does that work look like? What are the activities that constitute the work that helps us bridge cultures? That's a great question. So I talked about how sometimes when the work is exhausting, you need to take a rest. So right now, I am on a really long hiatus from Facebook because it's exhausting. Because um, I, I have these conversations. I, I, I'm friends with a lot of people on, on social media who are pretty different from me ideologically. 
And when someone says something that I think makes an assumption that's not correct or that I don't see as um, being part of my experience, I cannot resist the urge to, to share how my experience is different. You know, like I have a different experience. I'm not sure. I, I can see that this means something. I, I can agree with you on this, but over here I feel that it's different because blah, 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 blah. And um, that kind of work is, is exhausting because you have to, you know, be so earnest and you have to you know, have good intentions and you have to, you know, do these other things or else you're just trolling people, right? But I think that that kind of work, <laughs> I say this as I'm on hiatus, is something that we need and that, that is, that's necessary. And the way to kind of be able to do that kind of work without completely breaking down is to make sure that you really like the people you're talking with. So this means that we all have the obligation to make friends who are really different from us, whose ideological views we don't necessarily like. And, and there's lots of ways that happens. You know, we, we interact with people at school or in classes, or maybe we go to church with groups of people. And, and those are all institutions that help us to be in contact with people from different ideological or you know, civic cultures than our own. And that's, that's good. So it's tiring, which is why I'm on hiatus. We have time for one more question. I definitely agree with Mark Twain. Um, I wouldn't say that you know you don't have to go all over the world physically to un experience other cultures because, as I said, it's not just you know what people eat in Japan or what people you know the way that people talk on the East Coast. You know, culture is how people think, and I think um, you know my own family um, is from here, and they're some of the most kind of sophisticated, like broadly experienced people that I know. So, you know, there's people in Boston who don't know how to ride a four-wheeler, right? I don't know how to ride a four-wheeler. Or, or who don't, you know, know the beautiful experience of um, running up to the G or whatever the local letter here is. So, the letter on the mountains. So, but I guess, I guess my point is that, um, you know, it, it, to, to, I would say to anyone, if you live in a place where everyone thinks and agrees with you, then you probably should expand your circle a little bit because that's not normal for the human world that we live in. And if you, you, you know, on the internet, you can find plenty of people who disagree with you, who are different. And as you say, all those, be those wonderful things that you mentioned, the art and the music and all of that stuff. Does that sound good? I think so. Thank you very much.